Welcome, all you happy warriors. Wonderful to have you joining me, your rabbi, Rabbi Daniel Lappin, here on our weekly show. And so if this is your first time here, great to have you along for the ride. Do join in. And uh, if you are a regular friend, somebody with whom I share time on a regular basis every week, how wonderful to see you back. Now, I want to start off with a personal story, and I don't do a lot of that because I'm always excessively concerned about possibly wasting your time. And that is really one of the worst things in my mind that I could possibly do. And so I try and stay away from the personal anecdotes unless they add something to the discussion or they contribute something of value in some other way. Well, this particular story I feel is necessary uh, mainly because... I want to establish in your mind and heart my bona fides as uh, somebody who really likes animals. And so uh, I will tell you that uh, during my childhood in South Africa, uh, the one vacation that our family did over and over and over again without ever becoming tired of it or wanting. I mean, you never, ever heard any of the four of us saying to our parents, oh, do we have to go back to the Kruger National Park? Do we have to go back to this game reserve? Do we have to go back? Yeah, that's what we used to do. We used to go to game reserves. So they're called game reserves in various parks, national and state parks. In many cases, absolutely private ones as well, uh, where there was a very high probability of spotting animals and being able to park your car and just watch them. And so uh, I've sat with my family in, in a car for uh, two, three hours watching lion, a lion pride uh, devour an impala deer. Uh, I've watched a, uh, a huge herd of elephants drinking um, at a river just spending their time drinking and spraying each other with water through their trunks. We sat there easily a couple of hours just watching that. Uh, we've, we've, we've parked and watched giraffes grazing on the uppermost uh, shoots on a tree. Uh, we've, we've seen rhinoceros. We've seen uh, leopards. We've seen cheetah. And uh, it's just completely transfixed by it. We 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 just did. I mean, that's what we did. And and I I I almost can sense the the, the feeling again as I talk to you about it. I can almost feel the hair on the back of my neck starting to stand up when I used to think I've spotted something. And here's an interesting thing. Uh, we used to go for usually about a, a week or maybe 10 days at a time. And the, one of the reasons for that was that for the first two or three days, you just don't spot anything. It's not that the animals aren't there, but it's that their camouflage is so good that you just go right by them. And uh, one of the fun things we would occasionally do is take along a guide with us for the first couple of days uh, precisely to, to try and avoid missing things as we would do. And the guide would always, stop, stop right now. And we'd say, what, where? <laughs> and he'd always smile because he could see it perfectly clearly. And he had to show us. And eventually, after a few days, uh, your eyes adjust, your whole uh, perception ability improves and you get to see the animals as well and uh, it's it's thrilling and wonderful and uh i i have not been since i left i've never been back although when i when i start mulling and thinking and reflecting on on these days that's really the only thing i'd be interested in going back for 
Uh, I'd like to see Table Mountain again in Cape Town. Um, one or two, one or two other sites, uh, but mostly I would want to go back in order to see the animals again. So uh, I, I mentioned that, and I also want to mention something else. Before I started this show a, a few years back, I was doing a radio show, and uh, it was on um, a radio station called uh, KTTH in Seattle, Washington. I was also doing a, a show in uh, on KSFO in San Francisco, and um, and then eventually we switched to the podcast model because I wanted to be able to reach people all around the world, let alone all around the country. And it became increasingly obvious that more and more people were switching to podcasting. And I've seen some remarkable statistics now on the number of people that listen to podcast shows. I do myself, you know, if, if I'm in the car for any period of time, uh, I don't listen to the car radio very much. I usually just uh, pull up a podcast and uh, there were, there were, that's what I'm listening to. But uh, while I was doing this show for a few years on KTDH in Seattle, I, I was reminiscing that uh, the youngest child in families tends to get a little spoiled. And even if they're not really spoiled, the older siblings are absolutely persuaded that the youngest child has it easy. And uh, you know this this may be this may be true, and I, I certainly think it likely that in the case of our youngest daughter, I do think it's possible. Partially, she was so unbelievably charming and cute and and beguiling uh, that she did she have me twisted around her little finger. Well, I, I think that might be a slight exaggeration, but uh, but did she get away with things that her older siblings? Yeah, probably. And uh, I, so I'm talking on the radio about this and uh, telling listeners uh, some of the ways. And I said, I'll give you an example. Um, she asked me if she can get, if she was really into marine creatures. She loved orca whales, partially because of our summer boating trips in British Columbia. We'd always see orca whales and dolphins. She loved those. But then uh, we visited the Vancouver Aquarium, which had the most wonderful marine animal shows. And uh, they had a couple of beluga whales, which are not native to uh, northwestern waters. They're sort of more the east coast, northeast coast of Canada. But uh, nonetheless, very interesting uh, creatures. And I, I spoke on the radio about how my youngest daughter uh, wanted a beluga whale. And I said, I must say, I'm very tempted because I love, I just like giving her things she wants. She she does so much for me and brings so much joy into my life. Uh, you know, anyways, I said, but the reality is that one thing that a busy rabbi's household does not need is a beluga whale. And um, anyways, so... Um, we went to a commercial break, and the producer said to me, Rabbi, there's somebody on the phone. They didn't want to go on the air with you. It was a call-in show, but they wanted to speak to you during the break. So I pick up the, the phone, and who is it? It's Pastor Ken Hutchison, a dear, dear friend. Used to play for the Dallas Cowboys, and then um, went to Bible school, became a pastor, and uh, had built up Antioch Bible Church in in Seattle for for whom I'd spoken many times and uh, and we'd done a number of things uh, we actually had a uh, you know he is an extremely was I should say unfortunately uh, an extremely large huge bald man and uh, I uh, am a considerably less huge uh, bald white guy, uh, probably standing, I don't know, maybe seven inches uh, l shorter than he is. And uh, we used to do a, a show we took on the road a couple of times called The Jock and the Jew. And uh, 
one of the the uh, sort of bylines of the show that that people used to get a chuckle out of was uh, see if you can tell who is who or which is which and anyways we used to uh, do some interesting things uh, one of the things we did was we went together um, to a very um, an extremely liberal a progressive Jewish temple that was running a uh, a program uh, in favor of intensive gun control in the state of Washington, which is a uh, a carry state. So um, obviously, no one was happy about that, at least in in my circle. Certainly not in my family. But anyways, um, Pastor Hutchison and I uh, went there. And during the question and answer session, they glowered at me because they know who I was, but they'd never seen him before. And they assumed, oh, there's a black guy. He's obviously going to share their view. And they they gave him the mic. He was free to ask, well, did he let fly with a, uh, a, a crystal clear cutting polemic on uh, gun control? And I remember he finished off by holding out his two hands ahead of him in a classic uh, posture, and he said, uh, for me, gun control means holding the gun with two hands and aiming carefully. And there was just this shocked silence, and uh, and then little by little, a sporadic round of applause broke up in, uh, broke out in certain places around the auditorium. Anyways, I tell you all of that in order to say, this is who was on the phone, and he says to me, Rabbi, uh, I've got a, you know, he had a ranch. He used to live. He used to have horses and uh, and he used to breed Rottweilers as well. Uh, and he said, my next door neighbors are the Nordstroms from from the Nordstrom family. You know, the Nordstrom department store, great store. And he said they've they've got some wonderful llamas and they've just uh, had a new flock of baby llamas born. And uh, I know they would love for you to have one. So maybe you can't get a beluga whale for your daughter, but how about a llama? And I said, Ken, I, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I mean, we, we're sort of, I was kidding around on the air, but I mean, a llama, I, I'm not a farmer. I'd love to be, but I, I, how do you, uh, he said, listen, uh, I know all about this. There's really nothing to it. Uh, they're wonderful animals. Why don't you just bring the kids out to take a look at this little llama? Come out on Sunday afternoon. Uh, we'll spend some time together, and then we'll go next door and, and take a look at the, the llama. Well, that's exactly what we did. Uh, however, we didn't take Susan, but the kids came along. So the seven children pile into the van. We go driving over to Ken's ranch, and uh, and then we go next door and we say hello to the folks there and they show us uh, the llama they want to give me. Well, I got to tell you, not only the children, but me too. I just fell for this creature. Uh, he was gorgeous. He was sort of white with honey colored flecks and and highlights in his fur. And he had these big eyes and he just looked at us and I knew he was saying Please take me home with you. I like your children. I want to be part of your family. It was clear. That's what he was saying. And so I said to, uh, I said again to Ken, I said, well, how, you know, I mean, how would we even take him home? Even if we consider, he said he'd ride in your van. I said, come on, are, are you serious? He said, come, let me show you. And so he takes this uh, llama and the llama at this point, his head, his height, his overall height I don't know, sort of uh, probably up to my, uh, not quite my, close between my belly button and my chest. And uh, he brings him up to the door of the van and he lifts up his paws, four paws, and he places them on inside the van. And then he gives him a, a bit of a swat on the rear end and gives him a push, sort of a push and a boost on his rear end. And the next thing is the llama is in, is is in the van so then he, he pulls him out again and he does it again he puts the uh, four paws there gives him a swat on the back this time the llama just jumped up in the van pulled him out again brings him to the door of the van one more time gives him a little pat on the rear end the llama doesn't even think twice jumps up in the van turns around looks at me and says look 
I can fit in so easily to your family. And I nodded at the lama and I said, you're a real beauty. You're coming home with us. But then I said to Ken, but how do we feed him? What do we give him? And he said, no problem. And he went again, went to the, uh, the storehouse of the, of the neighboring ranch and he grabbed a two 50 pound bags. Yes, you hear me right. This man grabbed two 50 pound bags of llama food and he slung them on his shoulders and he walked over to the back of the van. We opened the door. He threw them into the back of the van and the, the llama uh, jumped into the van the kids climbed in and we had this hilarious drive home because <laughs> the the llama liked to put his nose out of the window so he'd you know and talk about strapping in right no who's, who's strapped in who cared it just wasn't a big thing for us we certainly didn't strap the llama in and uh, the kids just loved uh, every time we were at a stop light or a stop uh, the llama would put his head out and people in the adjacent car would uh, would do a double take and the kids just collapsed into hysterical laughter. And yes, the llama did become a, a treasured member of our family for quite a couple of years. It was quite wonderful. And uh, uh, how, did, how did it end? It only ended uh, because he, um, he became lonely. He was a, llamas are very much herd creatures. And after a, a couple of years, it became clear. He, he started feeling lonely. Uh, if we got a girl llama, we'd be in the llama business. If we got a boy llama, apparently they fight a little bit. So eventually, with tremendous reluctance, we took him back to his ranch, where he seemed to smile at us and said, thank you for bringing me home. It's been a wonderful visit with you, but now I have to go back to my family. And uh, he rejoined his herd, skipping and gambling. It was it was quite beautiful, and the the kids have never forgotten it. Neither have I. Anyways, um, the the llama. You know, I, I'll just tell you one more quick thing about the llama, and that is, we always uh, had friends join us for Sabbath meals, Friday night and Saturday lunch. Uh, you know, we were nine people ourselves, and then kids would have friends over. We would have some friends. So 20 people for a Friday night meal and for, a, again, Saturday lunch was perfectly normal. Uh, what the children did would do is uh, during the meal, without saying anything, one of the children would go and open the door to the yard and give a little whistle, and our llama would come and very elegantly step into the house and then walk to the dining room, and I have no idea, we didn't teach him to do this, but he walked all the way around the dining room table very slowly, stopping at each person. Maybe he was sniffing each person, I don't know, but it looked as if he was greeting each person. And then he would uh, conclude his circumnavigation of the dining table, and, uh, and then he'd lie down uh, in a corner of the room for a little bit, and then eventually he'd get up and want to go outside again. Anyway, the the look, I mean, we we all behaved as if it was perfectly normal, and everybody in our family just loved the amazing looks we got from the visitors who were subjected to this treatment by the llama. I could tell you a few other wonderful things about this llama, and maybe I will one day, uh, including, by the way, how incredibly clean he was you know people speak about you got a house training a dog or house training a cat and so you can't imagine you cannot imagine uh, the how amazing this creature was in that department and what you do to train um, anyway well, that's that's all but I, I will tell you one more thing which is that there was one bitterly cold night soon after we got the alarm I don't know in the first six months or something when winter came around and Susan and I lying in bed, and we could hear the wind outside, and we knew it was freezing, and there were even specks of snow flying around. So it was cold. It was it was really bitterly cold. And I, I just want to tell you that, uh, and I, okay, this is not to say that uh, I'm, you know, some sort of uh, great guy or anything. I'm, I'm telling you, I could not stay in bed. I was worried sick about the llama. Because Lama slept outside. We had a whole sort of place set up for him with lots of hay and straw and everything. It was a nice place. But anyways, eventually I just couldn't take it anymore. And I wrapped myself up and I went downstairs 
and I went out into, I opened the door into the yard, I gave the little whistle, and uh, I saw he got up from his straw bed, strolled over to me, and uh, and sort of said, uh, hi, what's up? Isn't this a little early for you? And I said, well, yes, it is. It's like 2 a.m. And yes, I know the llama wasn't actually speaking, but I knew what he was trying to say, for heaven's sake. And uh, and I said, are you okay? And he smiled and nodded at me and said, of course, I'm a creature from the mountains of the Andes. I love cold weather. As a matter of fact, I'm much more comfortable in this weather than I am in warm August days. And I said, are you sure you don't want to come inside and spend the rest of the night in the kitchen or anything? And Lama smiled and said no, and he trotted off to his, his bed. And I went back upstairs to mine. Uh, happy that I didn't have to worry about the llama. Why am I telling you all of this? Because as we move on into the next segment of the show, I want to talk about how dangerous it is for a society, how destructive it is for a society, when the distinction between animals and people becomes eroded. And uh, I don't want you to think that I am hard-hearted. I don't want you to think that uh, this is because I don't care about animals and I I want to maltreat and abuse animals. Nothing could be further from the truth than all of that. Uh, But nonetheless, I, of all people, given the fondness I have uh, for animals, and and by the way, I I was never without a dog growing up, um, in, in spite of all of that, I do, uh, I, I do want to explain that it is very easy and seductive to become identified with animals and to think of animals as uh, possessing anthropomorphisms and for animals to become person-like. And, to, and you saw I was doing it with my llama as well, and I did. I freely admit I did it, but that was my heart. In my head, I knew perfectly well what was going on. And uh, that is the purpose of today's show. I want you to be aware of some of the things going on in society, like animal crackers. What's Yes, there is the weirdest thing I'm going to tell you about animal crackers and uh, all of that, of course, coming up in the remainder of the show. All right, we went a little bit over time on this segment. I'm sorry about that, but uh, uh, we'll move on right on in just a moment when we come back. The website, rabbidaniellappin.com. And uh, we are still featuring a special uh, for folks who are part of this show. That would be you uh, for an audio product, a two-hour audio product, which you can buy either in the form of CDs or as a digital download, like you can do it immediately. Uh, And that is called Prosperity Power Connect for Success. And it's all about the secret of human connection, not animal connection, human connection and what it can do and what it can bring into your life, Uh, both in terms of social benefit, never mind romantic benefit, of course, but predominantly also financial benefit. We'll talk a little more about that, but that's at rabbidaniellappin.com, which is also where you can connect with me. And you can write to us at that website. There's an easy way to do it. You can also talk about uh, things we're covering or things you'd like us to cover. We love hearing from you at rabbidaniellappin.com. Back with you in just a moment. We're back. Me, Rabbi Daniel Lappin, reminding you, that the more that things change, the more we need to depend upon those things that never change. And the relationship between humans and animals and everything that that relationship signifies is something that never changes. Now, I have to first tell you that there are certain movements in human affairs that just take off and succeed and do really well. There are others that languish and die and linger for long and slow deaths. And the difference is usually not the competence 
or abilities of the people involved in creating those organizations or movements, they usually flourish or fail based on the zeitgeist, on the mood of the times, right? the, the zeitgeist, as the Germans put it, uh, the, the cultural temperature, what's going on in the uh, climate at the time. And uh, P.J. O'Rourke, the very funny conservative writer, uh, once said that the way you can tell whether a movement is thriving and growing and going to succeed, or it's just in the process of a slow death, is whether it attracts pretty young women. And there's a lot to be said. There's a lot to be said for what he says. There really is. For instance, uh, the anti-war movement of the 60s. Using P.J. O'Rourke's model, yeah, absolutely, certainly, it definitely attracted a lot of young women, and it had an enormous effect on everything that was going on in America at the time. Uh, more recently, much more recently, uh, there was a, an attempt to start a national movement for the homeless, something to really change America's attitudes towards the homeless. The guy's name was Mitch somebody or other. I can't even remember his name because it doesn't matter. It went absolutely nowhere and uh, it's, uh, not, it was not long for this world and died. Needless to say, when you looked at pictures of the gatherings, there were never any young women there, just not there. The uh, anti-smoking movement, the anti-drunk driving movement, these were very effective movements. Uh, yes, they attracted young women. And there were, at the same time, other movements that went absolutely nowhere. I'll tell you where else you see it. Uh, in evangelical churches, in non-denominational evangelical churches around the country, overflowing with beautiful young women. Absolutely. How about some of the older denominational churches, institutional establishment churches in town, the ones with empty parking lots on Sunday morning? Old people, mostly men, some old women as well, but no young women, not there. The same, by the way, is true in Judaism. The vibrant, orthodox, traditional congregations uh, filled with people and very liberally sprinkled with attractive young women. Older, reform and conservative temples, uh, the more progressive wing of Judaism, for the most part, not so much. So uh, there is something to be said for that. And the reason I, I tell you about this is because the movement for animal, well, I can't call it animal rights, because there are many people who would regard themselves as being pro-animal, but who wouldn't go as far as saying that animals have rights. And, uh, and that is actually where things are at at the moment. Um, the, there are circumstances under which courts have now accepted that an animal can sue and anybody can step forward to be the agent of that animal in suing. But we'll come back to that. For now, let's just think for the moment about the organization called People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. Okay, well, what's going on there? What are we talking about? First of all, you may have heard me say in the past that any time you hear the word ethics or ethical used, the very first thing you ought to do is say, excuse me, what system of ethics are you talking about? What is the framework of ethics you are using? Because there are many, many different systems of ethics. Right? There is a Muslim system of ethics, to which I'm sure not all Muslims subscribe, but enough do, who believe that uh, it is entirely appropriate to kill 
people who are not Muslims. That is an ethical posture. There are many different ethical systems. And so when people, for the ethical treatment of animals, the very first thing I would ask them is, I need to know what is the ethical framework. Now, a lot of people, when you ask them that, and I, I do it all the time, people say, well, uh, that would be immoral. I say, that's very interesting. Could you tell me according to what system of morality would that be moral? And very often people say, well, anybody can see that. Everyone would agree. No, that's not true. Not everybody would agree with that, and I'm sure I could find many, many issues that some people would say the moral and immoral division line is very different from where you would say it. So no, we do need to know what system of morality is really, really important. And uh, it, 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 it is relevant to uh, today's show because there really are different views on this, on what is ethical when it comes to animals. And I am going to present one view of animal ethics, which could hardly be further away from that advocated by Peter, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. And I am absolutely convinced that my approach is the more ethical one. And needless to say, Peter is more convinced that theirs is the more ethical one. Everybody believes that their own system of ethics is paramount. At any rate, the animal movement uh, using the P.J. O'Rourke thermometer is certainly doing fine. And uh, it's totally understandable. Now, let's look at a few things that Peter says. Animals are not ours to eat, wear, experiment on, use for entertainment, or abuse in any other way. And so right there, we have a problem, because I do not agree that eating animals is abusing them. You remember how the, the, their phrase goes? Animals are not ours to eat, wear, experiment on, use for entertainment, or abuse in any other way. In any other way means all of these ways are abusing the animals. I do not agree that eating animals is abusing animals. I don't believe that wearing fur or even leather is abusing animals. I don't believe that experimenting on animals for the purpose of saving human life is in any way abuse. And I don't believe that using animals for entertainment, provided there is no cruelty, and again, what cruelty to animals is, is also there are people associated with PETA and elsewhere who insist that any form of animal entertainment is abuse. I don't agree with that. And so right away, the, the founding mission statement of Peter uh, expresses an ethical system that isn't necessarily universal. It's not one with which I agree in any way whatsoever. Now, let me clarify at the outset that cruelty to animals is 100% out of the question and uh, explicitly prohibited in the moral system which guides me personally, namely a Judeo-Christian system of morality based on the Bible. Cruelty to animals, absolutely prohibited. However, the idea that putting an animal in a cage is necessarily cruel, I don't subscribe to. If it is unduly small, yes, of course. What is an appropriate size for a cage? Well, I spoke earlier about the times that I spent um, together with animals in Africa. Uh, animals have a very natural perimeter uh, beyond which they it doesn't matter to them. In other words, uh, when animals create a barrier at a certain distance, as all animals do, and by the way, in that sense, uh, people do as well, right? In other words, there's a certain point at which somebody's in your face. Um, most of us are uncomfortable on rush hour subways when people are pushed up against us. That's that's not natural. It's, it, it's uncomfortable for most of us. 
some people don't have a very good sensitivity of where to stand in casual, friendly conversation. But there's a certain point. Everybody has a sense of this, and most of us would agree on it. Uh, further than that, and, you know, <laughs> it, it sort of feels odd. You're, it's like, you know, you have to yell too close, and that's I'm, I, I feel a need to move back and get a little bit of distance again. And uh, animals have that as well. So the, the best kind of cage is, uh, or an enclosure is where the cage is built to the same dimensions as an animal's natural spatial area. And that, by the way, is exactly how uh, zoos function today, and it's exactly how uh, aquariums function as well. And uh, and there there it is. But again, what Peter says is, and again, I'm 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 quoting from their own material. Um, when you use an animal for entertainment, to me, there's no ethical problem there at all. Uh, how do I know? Well, because animals learn what people want them to do. And when uh, horses at a circus do their thing and, and elephants at a circus do their thing, or when dolphins and whales uh, jump and pirouette in, a, in an aquarium or seals do amazing things with blown up beach balls, uh, those animals do what they do in order to please the human being and obtain the the fishy reward or whatever it else it's going to be. That's what animals do. And it requires a baseless projection of human emotion to determine anything different. And so Peter says, animals are not actors, spectacles to imprison and gawk at or circus clowns. Yet thousands of these animals are forced to perform silly, confusing tricks. The word silly, by the way, only applies to humans. There is no such thing as silly for, for animals. Confusing, says who? Under the threat of physical punishment. It's not true. Everybody knows that uh, animals will perform best with the promise of the carrot, the, the, uh, the, the reward rather than the punishment. They are carted across the country in cramped and stuffy boxcars or semi-truck trailers, are kept chained or caged in barren. Boring. Boring? Animals can be bored? Really? You are projecting, my friends, and filthy enclosures and are separated from their families and friends. Hello? We're talking about seals. We're talking about horses. They are separated from their families and friends. There's a fundamental difference. Animals don't recognize their families, not even a week after birth. Most, some do, but not for much longer than that. All for the sake of human entertainment. Okay, big, big difference in approach there. Very, very big difference. Um, how's about um, the idea of having a pet? Do you own any pets? I don't at the moment, but I did own a llama, and before that, I used to own dogs. But wait, Peter discusses a slightly different term to be used. Says Peter, animal companions. No, they're not pets. They're my companion. For every lucky dog or cat who has a comfortable home, nutritious food, and loving owners, no, loving guardians, Countless other dogs and cats are suffering at the hands of incompetent or abusive people, are struggling to survive on the streets, or are waiting in animal shelters for a good home. Yeah, that part is certainly true. So, uh, and by the way, I'm not blaming Peter. They are riding a wave of the zeitgeist. They are riding a wave of where the culture is today when it comes to animals. And so, not surprisingly, Peter raises huge sums of money, and yes, they attract beautiful young women as well. So that gives you a pretty good idea of where things are at with Peter. But uh, I don't dispute for a moment that there is a very strong mood of closeness with animals. But after all, that is exactly what I'm talking about today. What's going on? I will try and explain that 
in the very next segment coming up. Our website, rabbidaniellappin.com, and uh, the resource at the moment is called Prosperity Power, Connect for Success. It's an audio program. You can download it. It's uh, two hours long, or you can have uh, the CDs shipped to you. But uh, it goes into the uh, the most important relationship in the area of financial resources, namely the one thing that unifies everybody who is financially successful is their Rolodex. Wait, Rolodex? Some of the younger listeners to the show have absolutely no idea what a Rolodex is. Hey, Google it, or maybe see it in a museum. But what I'm really talking about is your contact list. The trouble is, though, that many of us have contact lists with thousands of names in it. What I'm talking about is how many people in your contact list, and here's a great way to measure it, by the way, how many people in your contact list would answer your phone call? If they see you ringing them, how many of them would pick up? Or if you leave a message, how many of them would call you back within a few days? That is your real contact list. And that list is much smaller than most of us realize. But that is the list that is linked to our ability to create wealth. I explain in much greater detail what that means and how to employ that in your life for the benefit of your finances, as well as for the benefit of all those with whom you interact. Prosperity Power, Connect for Success, and it's at rabbidaniellappin.com. Back with you in just a moment. Welcome back, everybody. And uh, let's look for a moment as to why this whole topic is of interest. Well, the debate that has been raging through most of human history um, is really a debate as to this relationship between humans and animals. And one side of the debate says that the reality is as is portrayed in the first three chapters of the book of Genesis, the opening of the Bible, uh, where an enormous amount of ink, the, you know, a huge percentage of the words, are devoted to establishing that all creatures, you know, from bacteria and gnats and mosquitoes to elephants, are on one spectrum. Uh, some of them are mammals, some of them are reptiles, some of them are cold-blooded, some of them are warm-blooded, uh, there are birds, all kinds of things, but they're basically all creatures. And then entirely separate, touched by the finger of God, is the human being, whose creation is depicted in in entirely different ways. Uh, There's a moral dimension. Uh, There are instructions which are disobeyed. And, uh, And we get a picture of the human being as something completely different and quite unique, uh, with consciousness and awareness and and questions about his creator, questions to his creator. Then you've got another view, which dismisses that as as primitive and nonsensical and uh, and and religious and meaningless and uh, part of a mythology, and that science provides the real answer, which is that through a lengthy process of unaided materialistic evolution. Primitive protoplasm became plumbers and proctologists and and uh, potato chip wrinklers, etc. Uh, those are the two views, and the truth is that neither one can be established beyond any shadow of doubt. If that were the case, the debate would be over. Uh, for instance. It is said that a long time ago there was a debate over whether the earth is round or whether the earth is flat. By the way, I'm not sure that's true, but that's what people say. 
And uh, But that debate is over because it's now been established that the earth is not flat, it's round. Any time uh, something gets settled and established, then the debate is over. You can't simply say that, oh, all the people who don't accept it are morons, because there aren't any people who don't accept it. There are no real members of the Flat Earth Society. It's, uh, it's over, it's gone. As long as there continues to be vigorous debate, not on the part of closed-minded bigots, but on the part of uh, highly educated and trained scientists who are not at all persuaded of the idea that human beings are on the planet by virtue of a lengthy process of unaided materialistic evolution, uh, the debate rages. It can't be established. If it could, then it would be over. And that's exactly the point. The, the debate is philosophical in nature, and it reaches into every area of human experience, morality and philosophy and science. It reaches absolutely everywhere, including criminal justice. Uh, why? What's going on? Well, if enough people, and by the way, this will never be settled by a decree from Harvard University or a decree from Capitol Hill or a, uh, a decree from, of, from some prominent science populist. Uh, no, it doesn't work that way. It's when a culture, when people, the, the, the whole of society uh, buys into an idea, right? In, in America, people bought into the idea of not smoking. And so smoking became this hideous evil, like the worst thing you could do to such an extent, uh, I've mentioned this before, that a frightening majority of parents polled say they'd rather find out that their high school uh, uh, children were cheating at an exam than that they were smoking. All right? And I, I wouldn't agree with that myself. I'd go the other way. And so uh, the, 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 these these things really are a tremendous, uh, uh, turbulent um, issue, this, this whole question of, of who we are. Because why? Well, if you establish, if you decide, if you're part of a, a cultural group, and yes, a society in the West, and not just in the United States of America, but society is torn over this issue. And uh, if you are part of a social circle, in which uh, the view is taken that uh, people are really here as just as part of the animal world, just as animals evolved and became chimpanzees, some chimpanzees became humans, and literally over millions of years or longer, uh, people emerged the way we are today. And so uh, if that is the view, then you have dealt a death blow to morality. Yeah, that, that, that's absolutely right. Why? Because we do not use the term morality with animals. It doesn't make any sense, in spite of anything that Peter says. Uh, Peter speaks about how people behave, the ethical treatment of animals, but, uh, but not about animals being ethical or moral, because even Peter recognizes that that makes absolutely no sense. Um, when uh, when a wolf gobbles up a farmer's sheep, we don't hold a philosophy conference to discuss the deteriorating morals among wolves. No, it's what wolves do. It's recognized and accepted that animals are not like people in this respect. But wait, if you are part of a zeitgeist, if you are part of a cultural mood that just accepts it as an absolute unquestioned given that people and animals are all part of the same spectrum line and you move along and you find your way, you go from uh, reptiles to mammals and quadrupeds and then you come to uh, primates and then you come to human beings. And indeed, uh, there are even zoos uh, that portray it in that fashion. If you look at the National Zoo in Washington, D.C., and you look at the primate section, they actually have a, a mural showing the evolution of uh, animals to people. Uh, there was a period of time, this is 20 years ago, uh, where the zoo in Copenhagen, Denmark, um, had uh, the primates in one avenue, and then the final cage of that avenue, they put a human couple in there. This was a special display for a few weeks, and, uh, you know, a, a man and a woman stayed in that cage for a few weeks to help make this point that we are really all part of the animal world. Well, 
as soon as you do that, you're basically saying that we are nothing but animals, which means you take away our entire ability uh, to make any kind of moral distinction. And so, sure enough, as this began to uh, to take a hold, and it, it started in the 60s, in, in modern times, although obviously the debate goes back much longer than that, but it began to take hold of the culture in America in the 60s, and... Uh, and and it wasn't long before magazines like Time and Newsweek, weekly magazines, began doing cover stories showing how infidelity was genetic. And the point was, yeah, uh, animals do not have this idea of sticking to one mate for life. That's absurd. Uh, there are a few creatures that mate for life, but that is like a bizarre instinct and... Um, and you can tell that that's not real because in those, in the case of some of those animals, when the mate dies, the remaining mate doesn't re-choose another mate. He just sits there and pines. So it's it's just, you know, that there's nothing to learn from that. But the overwhelming majority of animals mate indiscriminately. And so supposing that people are in some kind of different category is silly once you realize that we are really just a different kind of animal. So why you think we should behave any differently in this area? Anyway, so on and so forth. It moved along, and uh, more and more, we began to do things that eroded the distinction between people and animals. And each time we did that, each new step we took down that path further corrupted the idea of a morality for human beings. And so... Uh, the the way this began to manifest itself was by um, projecting not only in one direction that we are animals, but the other direction also, animals are people. And that is where Peter came in and jumped onto that wave and continues surfing it to the present time. They are riding that wave just too beautifully because it's what the culture, it's what a large number of people now want to believe. And the reason's obvious, right? Because on a, a deep subconscious level, I know that if I can persuade myself that I am really nothing but a land-based whale or a talking chimpanzee, uh, then it removes all kinds of complicated issues that bother me in the quiet hours of the night uh, my my soul my future my morality my relationship with god my obligation to my wife my obligation to my children are those absolute or can i take uh, another avenue or another route and deep down i know that if i am indeed nothing but a sophisticated chimpanzee all kinds of amazing opportunities open up for me in the scope of human behavior and so we find this going in both directions and uh, in 1993 you'll remember the silly movie called free willy and again that that really was intended to catch the imagination of a generation of children which it did because those children grew up right 93 is 25 years ago or something and uh, those children uh, today are extremely active in funding peter and in helping to uh, close down aquariums uh, there are um, uh, th there's this tremendous uh, well, it's been done basically already. It was a tremendous effort, but it's been essentially done. They've destroyed uh, aquatic shows, the sea worlds and the ocean worlds. All of that is for most purposes is gone because they decided, as Peter states explicitly, that having animals perform for human beings is unethical. It's immoral, right? Because we're all part of the same family. Uh, wearing fur. I mean, really. If Aunt Agatha dies, would you really skin her and wear her skin? I mean, that's, that's, it's, it's grotesque to even think of it. So how can you possibly think of putting a fur coat on your wife's shoulders? What's the matter with you? And uh, Peter even goes further and says, Untold suffering takes place to make it possible for you to wear a woolen sweater. Uh, 
I, I'm not sure why it's untold suffering to shear a sheep in New Zealand or Australia so that I can wear a woolen jacket. I have no idea. But this is what is said. In other words, if, if you can absorb this idea that the first three chapters of the Bible are irrelevant, can be ignored, uh, then the only other approach is that we are sophisticated animals, but animals nonetheless. And pretty much everything else flows from there, including no circuses, no entertainment of animals. And yes, free willy has consequences. Uh, there is a, a very large uh, international food conglomerate. Um, it's called Mondelez International. It's a funny name. Uh, but it's a made-up name, and they're based in Chicago, and they own a number of brands. I think Kraft is a, a huge number of brands. It's a, it's a company with the annual revenue of $26 billion. It's huge. Uh, but one of their companies is Nabisco, and one of the Nabisco products is, well, it's Animal Crackers, Barnum's Animal Crackers. You remember Red Box? Uh, I'm sure you should. I mean, you definitely remember it, right? Red Box with uh, pictures of animals. Um, you, there's a lion and there's a polar bear, different boxes, elephants, baboons. But you'll remember they were all in cages on part of a circus. Barnum, right? Barnum and Bailey Circus. But again, circuses are immoral places in exactly the same way that maltreating human beings in the Roman Colosseum was a bad idea. Doing anything that seems even remotely similar to that on an emotional level with animals is equally abhorrent. And so now, if you don't mind, at the uh, pressure of Peter, uh, yes, that's right, they're enormously effective. Um, the uh, uh, Not only is the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus gone, shut down, uh, but also the Animal Cracker, the Nabisco company, has changed the boxes for Animal Crackers. No longer are the animals on circus wagons, you know, like the circus comes to town, uh, no, now the animals are still there, the same familiar red coloring, but now the zebra and the elephant and the lion and the giraffe and the baboon are all open. They're sort of wandering on an African savanna with trees in the background and not a cage to be seen in sight. This is all part of the same thing that we're talking about. This is the same thing going on. And, uh, and we find it happening absolutely everywhere. My, my goal here, obviously, is to give you the ammunition in order to enable you to analyze for yourself the things that are going on in society. And, um, and so when you read, as you may have over the last year or two, that the National Institute for Health, the NIH, is no longer going to use monkeys for any kind of health research. Right. Regardless of the value and regardless of, of the use, um, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, no more monkeys are going to be used. And then the latest thing, a year later or two years later, uh, they decided not only are the monkeys no longer going to be used, but uh, they're going to move all the monkeys to a special retirement facility. Um, and uh, all the monkeys are going to live out their lives at Chimp Haven in Louisiana, where there's 200 acres of federally funded facility. So we have gone from primates helping with medical research and uh, to now the primates are gone and they're going to be uh, funded by your taxpayer money in a kind of uh, retirement home called Chimp Haven, or, or, or is it called Chimp Haven? Something like that. Uh, anyways, that's what's happening. Why? It's Please don't believe the idea that, oh, all of a sudden we realized we don't need animals for research. It's absolutely not necessary. It's not going to save any more lives. I don't believe that. I just don't believe it. I think there's certain things that most likely can only be tested on a living organism. And I would say that if 10 chimpanzees have to die to save the, the life of one human child, that is a right thing to do. It doesn't make me thrilled and happy. I'm not happy the child is sick. I'm not happy that the animals have to die, but they do. 
That is, for me, an unquestioned ethical position. Needless to say, uh, PETA is far from the only organization, and its uh, devotees are far from the only people in America who would vehemently disagree with me on on that topic. And there you've got yet another example of how this people-animal debate rages. It's a very simple question. Is it worthwhile... uh, allowing, killing, having 10 bunny rabbits die to save the life of a child, 10 baboons die to save the life of a child? I say yes, and many people, in fact, say no. That's how this goes, and the debate rages. And uh, I will tell you when we come back just uh, a little bit more of why this is so important in the world and in our world right now. But first of all, the website, Rabbi Daniel Lappin. Dot com for those of you who are newcomers. Everyone else, of course, knows it, but what even you may not know is that we have a terrific resource. It's one I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled with uh, because it addresses such questions as uh, why, against all the rules of good writing, do so many verses in Scripture begin with the word and? In the Hebrew Bible, Uh, throughout uh, the five books of Moses, about 60% of the verses begin with and. Uh, There's one book of the Bible where it's 90% of the verses, only one book. And you won't be surprised that I explain all of this in the special resource available for listeners to this show. And the resource is entitled Prosperity Power Connect for Success. Well, of course, the word and is a primary connector, is it not? And so what, let's put it this way, if, uh, if the Bible is anything of a guide in the fundamental question of the relationship between people and animals, if indeed animals are one group of creatures on the planet and human beings are completely separate and different, if that is true, then the Bible probably also has something to say about human connectivity how, why, and when best to connect. Um, If that is the case, then this resource is the way to go. So it's rabbidaniellappin.com, and look at Prosperity Power, Connect for Success. It's a two-hour audio program. Download it right away if you want, or uh, alternatively, you can have it shipped to you as a a two-CD set. That's also no problem. While you're at the website, uh, do make sure that you receive Thought Tools, our weekly email. Make sure you receive Susan's Musings. Make sure you receive our weekly Ask the Rabbi. And uh, you might also want to browse through the website for any other information that we have up there that you might find useful in your life. We focus on ancient Jewish wisdom in practical ways that can impact your family, your faith, your friendships, and yes, your finances. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin, back in just a moment. Well, here we go together again on the Rabbi Daniel Lappin show, where I remind you that the more that things change, the more we need to depend on those things that never change. And one thing that never changes is this long-lasting debate people. Are we unique, touched by the finger of God like no other creature on the planet, or are we just another point on the spectrum line of endless evolution, everything turning into everything else, and we're just one of the stops along the way? The uh, the, the consequences of the debate are, are really quite serious, because uh, Many times people have said to me at lectures, uh, well, you know, what's what's the big deal? I mean, on the off chance that, you know, maybe animals do not like performing in circuses, let's shut down the circuses, you know. I mean, is that really too high a price for you to pay that, you know, how often did you go to the circus anyway, right, once every three years? So, you know, do something else. Go to a skating rink or something. But, uh, you know, what's so terrible about that? Or or really, uh, you know, look, um, yes, I know 
American zoos used to name animals. I don't know if you remember this, but uh, there were sometimes sort of star animals. It was a, a baby elephant or a baby, a new panda or whatever it is. They used to give them names and this made uh, people feel connected and everyone wanted to go to, uh, to the zoo, you know, to, to see uh, Ellie the new elephant or whatever it was. That practice has now been curtailed uh, once again by the movement. The idea is that it unnecessarily personifies the animals. And, uh, and it's weird, right? Because in a way, that's kind of what we're doing all the time. Uh, when we're saying they're not your, you know, they're not your pets, they're your animal companions. You're not their owner, you're their guardian. But at the same time, uh, they want to let the animals be animals in the wild, regardless of the fact that uh, animals um, have to deal with, you know, animals die from hunger. They die from predators in the wild. I don't have to take you back to my stories of the uh, uh, of, of the, the wilds in Africa. No, everyone knows that. Uh, whereas in a in a modern zoo, well looked after, medical care, food, and so on, the 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 life of the animal is is longer and more comfortable. And you know, but when you project yourself, when you say to yourself, "Well, the animal's just like me, and I wouldn't like to be in a cage," well, yeah, that is one of the fundamental differences between human beings and animals. If you said to a man. Uh, you are under arrest. You may not leave your house. If you leave your house, you will be executed. Literature is full of stories of people who literally could not resist the temptation to leave their house. It was just too much. What happens if someone's told, you know what, uh, you are confined to the county of Los Angeles. Now, the county of Los Angeles has more people in it than 40 states in the United States of America. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, I'm pretty sure that statistic is true. Maybe, maybe don't quote me on it until I've checked it. But uh, the you know, there's a lot of people there. So how bad can it be to be confined to the county of Los Angeles? Most of us wouldn't be able to withstand it. You know, we'd be okay for a year or so, but after that we'd be just because there is part of the human soul that yearns for freedom total limitless freedom to be able to go anywhere I choose. Maybe I'll choose not to go anywhere, but I don't want to be confined. Animals don't have that. Says who? Says me, right? Am I 100% right? Can I guarantee it? No. I can only tell you that in this life, I have to make up my mind what is going to provide me with my ethical framework. The two choices are either a Judeo-Christian Bible-based ethical framework or a secular-based framework. I choose the former. That's all. You have to choose. And let me make absolutely clear, people who are secular, in other words, people who reject what they disparagingly term as, quote, organized religion, it's always a silly phrase, isn't it? It's like disorganized religion is fine. They don't mind that. It's just when you're organized, that's the bad part of it. But anyways, uh, people who are uh, secular have every bit as much of a need for a system of ethics as do people who are religious. In other words, something that seems to support my view that we were created by God with bodies and with souls is that, in fact, human beings do seem to yearn to proclaim their virtue, right? So, uh, we, you know, we all do it, and it's perfectly legitimate. Um, I see nothing wrong. I mean, it, it, I imagine it would be very nice if people gave uh, charitably, anonymously, but I see nothing wrong with somebody letting people know that he's given charity. On the contrary, I think there's something good about it. I think it helps encourage other people uh, to do exactly the same thing. It's a good thing. Uh, and people people do that. You'll find people's names up on buildings that they've dedicated, wings of hospitals and so on and so forth. It's great. I have no problem with that at all. I, I think it's wonderful. Uh, but in the same way, secular people have their ways of proclaiming their virtue. Uh, one of them is, by the way, right now there's a whole debate about the ethics of having zoos in the first place. Uh, there's another one. 
you'll pardon me, I really am not trying to gross you out or anything, but uh, I encountered a serious discussion. And when I say a serious discussion, I'm talking about uh, it It has a place in academia. There are conferences about it. There are people devoting considerable hours of their lives to this. And that is the debate whether toilet paper or bidets. And if you don't know what a bidet is, then uh, join the club. I didn't until quite recently. I'm just, you know, that all there is to it, I don't spend a lot of time in Paris. Uh, but at any rate, uh, the um, this is a serious discussion. What's better for the earth, toilet paper or bidets? And there's this, I mean, it's laughable. You know, from my perspective, it reads like satire. You got the one group of people saying, you know what, uh, we shouldn't use toilet paper because it means trees being cut down. Well, yeah, obviously, that's how you make paper. So plant more trees, which is exactly what paper companies do. They maintain huge forests. And I've seen a lot of these in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, they cut down um, one section of trees for for building houses and for building furniture and for making paper. They immediately replant it. And so it goes. There's, yeah, it's just like growing sunflowers or corn. But no, again, it's interesting that once again, the Bible uh, gives a hint at this, that the time will come when people will view trees as holy. And sure enough, sure enough, uh, in this movement, there is a view that trees are the sort of special thing, that cutting down a tree is a sin. In secular ethics, cutting down a tree is a sin. So toilet paper is a really, really bad thing, let alone the disposal of the toilet papers is very bad. Okay, this is serious adults having this conversation. Then the other side comes on and says, uh, and so they're saying you must use bidets because that way no trees have to be cut down because all it does is uh, squirt water to your nether regions. Um, The other side says, what are you talking about? Do you understand how much shortage of water there is? And let alone that, but many modern bidets have heaters built in to make it more comfortable and to raise the temperature of the water. And that uses energy. And these two sides are standing there debating seriously about which is worse for the planet. And so you might say that... um, uh, no, you know, no harm, you know, if if uh, if if people want to uh, sh- shut down zoos or if people want to um, shut down circuses, all of these things they do want to do. They want to stop using names for animals uh, if, with, with all of this. You know, what harm can it do? Let people do their stuff. Well, the problem is that it is inextricably bound up with socialism. These two do go hand in hand. In other words, if if you are somebody who feels extremely strongly that people and animals are basically the same thing and because people would hate the idea of having an owner, that's like slavery, animals don't want an owner either. If you believe that just as people should be able to sue, animals should be able to sue as well, as I alluded to earlier, then I can tell you that there is a very high probability that politically you also are a person of the left. You subscribe to the left. And so uh, from my perspective, the more that people are seduced into this animal equals people equation, the more people are going to vote on a left-leaning platform. I don't care whether you live in Sweden or England or Pakistan or the United States of America or Zimbabwe or anywhere else. Uh, Left-leaning governments, the governments that pull towards progressive policies of socialism, uh, are cruel and they're bad for ordinary human beings. They, They cause misery and suffering after extremely lavish promises of uh, being able to get so many things for free doesn't exactly work that way. This is, again, back to the idea that socialists see themselves as farmers or zookeepers, and all the rest of us are the animals, and our needs are absolutely as predictable as the needs of animals. And just as you can keep an animal happy by keeping it healthy and giving it medicine and giving it food and taking care of it, 
So as long as you give people total security from the cradle to the grave, uh, they too will be happy. And in return, we can ask for all their productivity, each according to his ability, to each according to his need, is the noble-sounding Marxist phrase. But what it boils down to is essentially the slavery of socialism, where you simply switch the slavery to a, a boss to the slavery, to the government. The government, through taxation, takes everything you make but legitimizes it by giving you everything you need, or so it goes. And uh, this is a very important thing to understand, that if you take the secular side, not the Bible side, but the secular side on this question of people and animals, then you are going to more than likely also tend to vote left, vote socialist. And the avenue is usually the avenue I've just described. In other words, it's not that people say, you know what, Marxist policies make sense to me, so I'm going to vote left. Uh, I'm going to vote toward anything towards the progressive side is what I'm going to vote. And, by the way, once I'm doing that, I'm also going to be on the people equals animal side of uh, of the argument. No, it goes the other way around. Um, animals are very seductive. Um, I understand. Uh, I understand why, especially um, there are many young couples who, rather than having a child, get a, a dog or a cat, and they start talking of it as their child. I mean, I've I've, I've seen this. I, I haven't done a study. I don't know how many people, but I've seen a few people as I get around the country to uh, to know that this is real. There are people who do that, uh, and I understand it. I, too, have gazed into the big brown eyes of a cow, and I do. I get over, I, 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 get, I overflow with gratitude that there is this beautiful creature that gives its milk to give me dairy products and and cheese and ice cream, and all it asks for is to be looked after in return, or gives me beef, that's also good. Uh, All of these, and I I look at the animal, and, and I'm filled with gratitude, not so much to the animal, but to God. But I do feel warmly towards the animal, and I would not uh, be able to sit idly by if anybody were cruel uh, to the animal in my presence. Uh, what is cruelty? Cruelty is causing the animal uh, unnecessary suffering, you know, beating it or whipping it. I, I don't like seeing horses uh, whipped. I don't like seeing any animals treated like that. Doesn't mean I won't eat a cow. Doesn't mean I won't wear leather shoes. Of course not. So it's a, a matter of a general concern uh, because without religious input, without the first few chapters of the Bible laying out the format of reality when it comes to the human-animal question, a child invariably grows up with an affinity for animals that grows quickly towards a tipping point where the, uh, the child and the adult Uh, resulting become automatically of a mind that people and animals are very close. We're all part of the same thing, which means that that person then becomes yet another voter in a democratic society for the progressive and destructive policies of the left. It is a matter of concern. And so when I speak about the seduction of animals, that's partially what I'm talking about. Uh, if you don't, if you weren't raised in a religious environment in which uh, clarity of uh, ethics is taught, then as a child, if you saw the movie Free Willy, you really wanted to devote your life to freeing animals. That's what you wanted to do. Uh, it's it's unavoidable, and the journey from there towards uh, leftist policies absolutely unstoppable. That's why I do consider these things to be uh, extremely serious and extremely important. But uh, as always, I'm absolutely fascinated by your comments. 
Uh, some of you listen to this on YouTube, and there's people comment there. Some people listen on uh, SoundCloud. Some people listen on uh, our website, rabbidaniellappin.com. Uh, wherever, there's always ways to let me know your reaction, how you feel about these things, what thoughts and ideas my words stimulated for you, and um, I would love to hear from you. But that is as far as we can go now. I will just tell you that uh, I have been uh, uh, writing lately for some thought tools that you'll be reading soon a little bit on this topic, including why the Bible is so emphatic about not drinking or eating animal blood. So the Bible, which allows us to eat meat and speaks about which meat Jews are allowed to eat, which meat we're not allowed to eat, but whatever animals you're allowed to eat, the blood may not be eaten because it's, uh, it's the life force and it's the spirit of the animal. Uh, and this is mentioned not once or twice, but seven times in the five books of Moses. And part of that emphasis is exactly what we're talking about. And as you teach a child a scripture from Genesis all the way through Deuteronomy, you're going to have seven opportunities to say, so why does God so emphasize that you're not allowed to have the blood? Because primitive tribes used to drink the blood of their enemies. Uh, there are tribes in Africa today that drink the blood of animals specifically to get some of the qualities of those animals. Uh, I, I didn't check, but I seem to recall that there were some uh, American Indian tribes that used to uh, also believe this. And, and they're not completely wrong. The idea that the blood does contain something of the spirit of the animal this is not something I can explain in, in the next 30 seconds, so I'm not going to try. But uh, the, the point being that the Bible emphasizes this distancing from animals. Look after animals, have pets if you want, but always be aware of the difference. Why? Because animals and the whole animal world is incredibly seductive. Apart from anything else, the notion of being animal-like and not having any rules not having a morality imposed on us. It's very appealing, very appealing indeed. I get it. And the end result of that is a societal move towards the left, which is essentially a, an abrogation of freedom and independence and a move back towards slavery by human tyrants, which is, after all, a perfectly good definition of socialism. Not a good outcome at all. But ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being part of the show today. Uh, please go to the website, rabbidaniellappin.com. Uh, there are also, there's a contact us tab there where you can write and let me know uh, any reactions you had to today's show. I would like to know. And you can also take a look at a resource specially created for you called Prosperity Power Connect for Success. And uh, it is a two-hour audio program. You can download it if you want right away now, or you can get it sent to you in the form of two audio CDs. But uh, either way, it is all about the fact that uh, human joy, human delight, human achievement, and financial profit all come from when human beings connect with one another. Not surprisingly, along with the whole discussion of animals and humans, the first few chapters of the Bible are very devoted to the idea of connection. And I explain all of that in this audio program, Prosperity Power, Connect for Success. And uh, the success is not just financially, but very specifically financially, as well as family-wise, friendship-wise, and yes, actually even connection to God. Uh, so for those of you who want to bring more connection into your lives, go to my website, rabbidaniellappin.com, and read more about that. Which means that we are as far as we can go for today's show. I really hope you enjoyed this show. Um, it's It's been a topic I've been working on over the last uh, month or two. I've been writing on it and uh, and thinking about it. 
and uh, and I am going to be sharing more on this in some of my writing over the next little while. At any rate, thank you for being part of the show. Be sure you join me. You can also go back, by the way, and look at uh, past shows, shows you may have missed. Please do that as well, because uh, the more we do that, the more you and I connect. You get to know who I am, and through your correspondence, your connecting with me, I get to know a little bit more about who you are. And uh, when you are on our mailing list and you receive our weekly emails, you'll also know where, when I'm going to be visiting into your neighborhood. I speak in uh, many, many churches, many, many synagogues around the, the country. And uh, when I do speak in your area, hey, I really enjoy meeting you. Don't hesitate to come on by. So until next week, I am Rabbi Daniel Lappin wishing you a week of good health and prosperity. God bless.